Well, I guess that, that we've always, again, I can't explain why, but we've always been drawn to the shadow region, the things that lurk or seem to straddle that, that, that just edging off into shade. Um, and I guess it's because it's, it's, it's things that seem to be happening that want to try to form, form themselves I'm quite sure about it, might dissipate, slide off. And that, and when I say that, that could apply to the way you treat a narrative, the way you tell a story, if you tell it slightly incompletely or purposefully, like veering away from, like trying to, I mean, it's like doing a circumference of, a, of an object in one respect. As an idea, but at the same time trying to find the doing it the inside also. I think there was something that that we liked that when we did Institute Benjamenta, Balzer talked about um, an in-between world between dream and reality. And I think that animation very beautifully inhabits that can inhabit that zone. Because it's sort of, um, because it isn't one or the other. And I think it's in that half state that you could say it's more subliminal or it's more liminal. Um, and I think, and maybe it's because we have a, a, a um, the person, we have a, a hard time being like a, aggressively strong about saying an opinion or, or that we want to state something absolutely certifiably that it's, it's this or it's that. I, I, it's not our nature. I think we want to look for the gray. The it's area. the nuance, I think, that yeah. everyone's looking for. And the discovering with objects, the discovering around sound. Because in a way, you can say glass has a, a certain sound, but it depends whether it's being, it's breaking on, on the floor, whether it's being filled with water, or whether this, this object can have its own, another imagination, one that you can do a whole and view it with, with respect to a so-called narrative or non-narrative. But I think uh, there was going to just add one further thing was that, and then it also applies to, for instance, if you do, as we've often done, adapt a text, like the, the Gilgamesh story is a relatively a dark story, it's about beating somebody into submission, particularly Enkidu or something like that. Um, Crocodiles, for us, was really, I mean, when we did Bruno Schultz, I think we were drawn by, by his, his discussions on, on matter and form and on degraded reality and, and then finding a form to contain some of those philosophical thoughts, but it, but it it's obviously that we, we, we tried to find a visual language to, to embody his, his thoughts. And it is relatively dark, darkish material. Um, or, uh, or, for instance, Institute Benjamin, which is a very, very much Valser loved to be tell the fairy tale. So there's a little bit of Sleeping Beauty or the, the, the prince who arrives to give the kiss of life, but actually, in fact, gives the kiss of death. So. I think it's us modifying and, and ruminating through, through what the text gives us. Um, but I, I guess we, we definitely don't have a cheerful side to the, to the films, but um, we haven't even betrayed because we just were Boy Scouts at heart or something. <laughs> I wonder if it's whether you guys um, associate the traditional meanings that are, that are tied to light and dark you know, saying constantly the dark side shadow, well, whether you see them as being associations of evil, cruelty, mm -hmm. brutality, um, you know, whereas the light, yeah. the white is bright, cheery, yeah. happy, yeah. good, or whether or you're pure, maybe. or purity, yeah. you know, and, and all the negative associations. Yes. Um, I think negative isn't, isn't strong enough, uh, yeah. to say. or whether you just don't see that and say, well, just because something looks dark and scary and mysterious and 
so on, it has as much potential to be benevolent as malevolent. I mean, it's like there's um, I mean, the object that, that creeps into the light, but only for a second in order to go back into the safety of the shadow, also has a volume of, of uh, its own sanity, you might say. The fish that lives 20,000 meters beneath the sea, that we don't get to see. What about them? But they look very evil, right? <laughs> they do. <laughs> you know, but aren't they? They're not evil. Is that what you're saying? They're not like just flounders. Or well, the ones with the teeth. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I think it's probably, I, I think we wouldn't think that, that bluntly that, oh, dark is therefore evil. Mm -hmm. I don't think we, we equate that. I think it's a much, because it, it, even, even goodness can hide in the shade out of protection, so I think we can invert it. So, um, well, those insects that live beneath a rock, you turn it up, there's a light on it. Alright, a couple of quick things. One, what's interesting is, uh, I have one question and one interesting kind of anecdote. In terms of shadow, shadow puppetry, I think is an interesting thing to look at in, in the museum. actually refers to the hide, which is what they use to create the, uh, the the outline of the puppets that they use, which is interesting because it's kind of the surface of a yeah. kind of flesh mm -hmm. that they use to cast the shadow on, on a screen. I don't know what the conceptual relationship or anything would be to your work, but I mean to think about it in those terms again between and this distinction um, of body and like and cast shadow or something. But uh, I had a question about Balser that I wanted to ask you yesterday. He was also a miniaturist. I mean, I'm sure you guys know. And, and I was wondering, like, uh, also if like your interest in the Museum of Jurassic Technology had to do with those extreme, those miniaturist. What are they? They're, they're birds that are like suspended on strands of hair. And you have to look at through a little microscope. And uh, Balser's work, from what I've heard, the process of translating it. it doubly difficult because you have to use a microscope in order to read his writing before it can even be translated. But at the end of his life, uh, I think before he went into the asylum, he, he found that working with the pen became very tiring, so he moved to uh, working with a pencil. And I think out of a, a mixture of uh, increasing receiving rejection upon rejection from, for his writings, that the handwriting retreated and smaller and smaller, and, and that they found, uh, at the end of his life, they found a, a shoebox full of, and they would also be just rejection slips from the author, and on the back side, he would write a story. But it was a, you know, a microscopic script, which um, it was in the old Zutelin, German script, which people thought was a private code, but which we, this is the turn of the century, he wrote in that old text form. And uh, at the Walser archives, there's these, we met these two men, one of them looks a bit like Thomas, with this great beard. You're many things, Thomas. We <laughs> found you everywhere. <laughs> And these men have dedicated their lives for 20 years, you know, with the giant bifocal lenses, translating these micrograms, which have been published. And there are these amazing stories, but it's um, deeply sad. Um, and apparently, we found out there was recently a big exhibition in Cologne, Cologne called Notation, dealing with writers and musicians and, and the way that they actually, their handwriting and how